Hi, my name is Tom Shannon. I'm the Scottsdale, Arizona Fire Chief, and today myself and Emma are here to tell you a little bit about Fido bags and their origins. Fido bags were the brainchild of a battalion chief in the Glendale, Arizona Fire Department some years ago. And the idea caught on when Marie Peck of the Fetch Foundation realized that first responders, firefighters, law enforcement all needed tools in their toolbox, if you will, to, uh, to offer a solution to our pets when we encounter them in emergency situations. So inside the Fetch uh, Foundation's Fido bag, you'll find specialized EMS equipment and supplies that are customized for the shapes and, and types of animals that we encounter in the first responder world. I can't tell you how important that it is that you've all taken the time to uh, be trained in pet care and the use of the Fido bags as the reality is, is that uh, we've seen in Scottsdale and all across the state the benefit of having tools and supplies that specifically address the needs of pets. And as you know, it's not just people that we encounter in emergency situations, it's their pets as well. So pets are people too, and we want to have the right supplies to, to care and treat them. Right? Okay. Thanks for uh, listening and enjoy your training. Hello, I'm Dr. Cliff Favor, and I've been practicing medicine since 1987 and own my present business since 1994. We are actually a 24-hour facility, seven days a week, um, and we employ about 10 veterinarians. Um, in about 2007, uh, we saw a need with the Fetch Foundation to educate firefighters and help the emergency uh, uh, responders in animal emergencies. A lot of times they, we knew that they were faced with emergencies but did not have the equipment or the knowledge a lot of times to be able to take care of them. So we've uh, partnered with the Fetch Foundation with the Fido Bag program to help educate as well as supply them with the necessary uh, tools to, to do what they need to do in the field. We'd like to go over a few items in the Fido bag so you kind of know what's in it, so you can get an appreciation. And probably the thing that's most important and the thing that I find with most firefighters that they get the most concerned about is restraint. Um, this is something that, of course, you're not well trained in because you haven't been around it. So uh, we have several items in the bag to cover that, from leashes, which, which makes it easy, and we'll show you how to use those a little bit farther. Uh, longer ropes, if you need to get a hold of them, we actually have um, horse uh, ropes so that you can also work with them. Uh, one of the things that uh, a lot of firefighters find interesting is just even a pillowcase. Uh, this is something we use very commonly for cats. Uh, cats, if you can't see them, they think they're safe, so uh, using that is very helpful. We also have a set of gloves for that fractious cat so it can protect. Of course, the blanket is an amazing thing to be able to catch animals as, as well as restrain them, uh, keep them warm uh, in, in the process. Probably the second most important thing in the, the bag is the oxygen mask. Um, realizing uh, most trucks are not set up for masks that work for animals. Um, they're more set up for humans um, with the nose cannulas and that. This is actually set up where we can stick the nose of the animal into the uh, chamber and, they, and we have tubing in, in that where you can hook to your oxygen uh, uh, equipment so that we can deliver oxygen to the pet and get it there very easily. Uh, we also have a full set of bandage material that can be utilized, um, KY jelly for wounds um, so that we can take care of that, uh, fluids um, for flushing wounds and taking care of that. Uh, we also have a set of splints that can be used for fractures or immobilization for the, the pets. Uh, we also include a burn sheet. Uh, we also have a collapsible water bottle. Um, so that we can get uh, water to animals that may be dehydrated or in need. Okay, probably the most important thing that we, we fight in, in a situation where an animal is hurt or scared is the restraint. Uh, somehow we have to get our hands on them to be able to do anything uh, helpful for their situation. So, slip leash, wonderful situation for being able to catch them. 
uh, a lot of times coming over the top of their head, sliding back and, and, and tightening the restraint is important. Now, realizing a lot of these animals are going to be hurt. They're going to be a little fractious. They're, they're scared. Um, you know, being calm, moving slow, not getting aggressive with your movements are very, very important. Um, being their friend, not their enemy. Uh, sometimes getting down on one knee and calling them toward you is helpful, but we still have to get our hands on them. So getting the leash on is probably one of the most important things. Now, if we do have a fractious animal, um, we're going to need to control those teeth so somebody doesn't get hurt. This lead also doubles as a very nice muzzle. You can take it over the top here and do a quick wrap and now you've got a muzzle. I will take the end of that and go around the, the uh, loop part on the neck and we're, be, we're able to restrain them very efficiently on that. Uh, realizing you don't have to do it so tight that they're uncomfortable, but just tight enough that they can open their mouth and get you. Uh, because we don't want to get hurt in this, this process. Uh, and then you can see, of course, Franklin is a great uh, specimen on that. They, they don't, it's not always that easy. A lot of them will try to scratch and, and tear that off. But this is a lot more um, acceptable in, in their um, eyes versus a muzzle. The other thing to remember is your positioning in the, the process. If you're taking a dog face on like this, you got a chance of getting hurt. So your positioning should always be behind the head very calmly, this will be the kind of restraint that I'll use where I'll grab both sides of the neck so I can control this head until we get them into a position that we've got a muzzle. Uh, um, and sometimes that's hard to get into that positioning, but realizing this is your safest. If you get to the side, very calmly they're going to turn on you and you're going to get hurt. So always work from them with the back wherever you can. There again, it doesn't have to always be aggressive. If you've got one that's really nasty, then uh, you have to be a little more solid with them. But a lot of these dogs will just go ahead and uh, relax. So a little love goes a long ways. But don't put yourself in a bad position. Remember, they hurt. When they hurt, sometimes they think you're the source of it. So we have to make sure that we're always protecting ourselves in the process. Small dogs are a little different. Number one, they're very fast and they can uh, uh, get away a lot easier. So the same thing applies with the, 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 the noose. I handle them very differently though because a big dog, um, you're, you've got a lot more to deal with and a lot more power. These guys typically are used to being carried, so that's to our advantage. So you can take a dog like this, pull them forward and scoop them up. And a lot of times this is how you're going to restrain a small dog constantly keeping that leash away from you so that they can't turn and get you in the face. Um, but usually when you have them in their, your arms, this is a comfort zone for you, uh, for them. And they will go ahead and relax and a lot of times you can do what you need to do very easily. Same thing applies, you can do the, uh, the muzzle like we talked about. Just, it, it's much easier probably with one person stretching the neck out, another person coming in behind and holding the head. Uh, realizing the teeth is what we worry about here. So we need to control that. Don't get your fingers in a bad position because they will bite you at that point. So keep your fingers in a good spot. Underneath the jaw is the best place, but controlling that head. Once you control the head, you control the animal. And I don't care what size of animal you're dealing with, anywhere from a small dog all the way to the horse. The rule is you control the head, you control the animal. With your bag comes an oxygen mask with the tubing that will go ahead and hook into your oxygen system. Realizing there is multiple sizes on these, but we found that this one size works for most dogs. Now, realizing in a, a big dog, all you're going to be able to do is get the nose part in uh, the, the opening here. Uh, reality is the small dogs, we can actually create a little mini oxygen chamber by actually sliding their whole head into the the unit there and getting pure oxygen to them. This works very efficient for taking care of it. We don't have to intubate uh, and we create a nice oxygen chamber in the process. Uh, so this works very, very well when you, you need to do that. It also works as a certain amount of restraint. So if you have a dog that's a little fractious, you can put their head in there, put your hand on the back of their head so that you're holding it very tightly in there. And a lot of times even being in there, they feel safe. You can cover it up if they, that, that helps so that they don't see you. And uh, a lot of times they'll relax in the process also.
Cats are just a little different because not only do we have to worry about teeth, we also have to worry about claws. Um, the leash can be a plus minus type thing and you have to use a little discretion on that. It's nice because we can catch them, but if the cat's real fractious, it's not uncommon for them to crawl up that leash and up your arm to go with it. So do this very, very cautiously. I don't like to use a tight restraint on that because that makes the cats very nervous. The only reason I put a leash on them is so that we can keep them um, under control. Gloves are very, very important in the fact that the gloves will provide a protection so you don't get scratched. So whenever possible, it, it's worthwhile putting these on, realizing that gloves do not stop the teeth. Um, this is more for scratches than it is for the teeth. Uh, some of the firefighters have the Kevlar gloves. Those are very good for protection and can be used in this situation to prevent problems. Probably one of the best restraints you can use is a pillowcase. Uh, cats are funny in the fact that when they, they, you can't see them, they're very happy. Um, so it's not uncommon, you can put your kitty cat in a bag like this. And I actually have many of my clients show up with what looks like the country ham, carrying their cat like this. And you notice the cat's not fighting, it's not freaking out. Uh, they actually feel very protected in this. So if you have troubles, just be gentle, so because you can't see, take and even tie that off, and, and at least you can control the cat. You will have the occasional cat that will freak out in a situation like that, but the majority of them like it. In fact, if you have a cat at home, you know a lot of times they like to crawl into bags, they like to hide. Um, this also can be used as a restraint in this manner so that we can cut down on the potential of getting scratched. This way we only have to deal with the teeth, we're not having to worry about the claws as much. Realize that if you're going to use this, sometimes your best position is keep them in close. Uh, kind of papoose them so that those, those feet can't go flying because if you're holding them from a distance, there again, a lot of times they'll be quicker to get you. So bring them in close, go ahead and keep this fairly tight restraint and, and we can do real well. Always watch the teeth. Uh, cat bites are probably some of the worst bites that we can get for the simple reason they carry very bad bacteria in their mouth. If you do get bit in a situation like this, I recommend that you get uh, doctor's assistance right away. Um, that doesn't mean instantly, but uh, you are gonna need to get on some antibiotics because you can get some very bad infections, even to the point that people lose their arms and lose their lives over cat bites. If I had to pick, I'd rather be torn up by a dog than bit by a cat, uh, just because of the seriousness of it. So please, please do not take that lightly if you ever do get bit. Uh, We also talked about oxygen uh, in our dogs. This same mask works very well for a kitty cat. It works very similar to a small dog. You can actually place their whole head into the uh, oxygen mask and they do very well. As you can see, kitty cat's gonna back up and, and, and respond a little differently. There again, if we have them in the pillowcase, we have them papoosed, uh, we can do this and do this fairly well. One of the things that cats there again, as we talked about with the, the pillowcase, covering this up is helpful because if you can't see them, they feel safe. Uh, this is one of their kind of happy places, shall we call it. So cover that up so that they're not seeing the world around them and they'll do much better. One of the things, there again, we keep talking about hiding the cat makes them feel more comfortable. This is where the blanket comes in very efficient in the fact that a lot of times you can put the blanket over the cat and the cat will relax. There again, they can't see the, uh, what's going on. When in doubt, you can also put pressure on the, the um, blanket on each edge, kind of restrain them doing that also. Uh, this is a way you can actually give fluids a lot of times to a fractious cat. By stretching the blanket out, holding them tight, you can actually go through the blanket and give fluids that way. Uh, it's a way of protecting yourself, cutting down on the potential of, of getting scratched. I'll even go so far as to kind of ca cocoon them and, and stretch it this way so that they, they think they're in a nice little hidey hole and you can do what you need to do. By putting your elbows in there, you keep them from being able to reach up and get a full swing with those claws. Um, they very rarely are gonna bite through the cloth because that's not something that, that uh, 
Um, they don't know their target, so they, they usually won't do that. A lot of cats will just go ahead and relax on this. Don't overdo it to the point that you oxygen starve them, but most blankets are porous enough that you can breathe and get done what you need to do. Just know anytime you're dealing with a cat, time's of the essence. You've got to get it done and get it done quick so that you can get away from them and let them relax. The longer you deal with them, the, the more fractious they're going to be. When you're giving things like fluids, realize that you can take a cat that's semi-comatose and you can have the Tasmanian Devil within three to five minutes. A lot of cats are like a wilted flower. When they're dehydrated, they're down and out. You give them fluids and they will, will bloom in a hurry. So just be aware that what starts off very down and out can become very fractious. So plan ahead so that you're ready for that reaction if it does occur. One thing to remember when you're dealing with animals, when you control the head, you control the animals. So one of the things that we are faced with a lot of times is having to do something on the animal's body. Um, and we need good restraint. It's very hard to do that standing up because there's too many variables in that. So a very common position we will do is we will lay dogs on their side like this. And it's important to realize that two things have to happen for this animal to get up. One is the head has to come up, the other thing is the under leg has to get underneath them. So we're going to use that to our advantage. We're going to lay our arm on the neck, which controls the head from getting up, and we're going to grab the underside leg. By using this kind of restraint, you can hold down a very large dog um, that may outweigh you even and, and be able to do that because every time they try to pull the leg down, you put more pressure on the neck and it will stop the, the, the process there. So remember this, it's also not a bad idea to grab the underside leg on the other side and that just adds even more restraint. This same thing applies even to a horse. If you can control that underside leg and, and, and put pressure on the neck, you can keep a horse from getting up also. So it can be used at any size animal, it's just a matter of understanding the concept. Once we have this, then we can do a lot of things. This allows us for splinting, it allows us for wound care, um, it allows us to, to, to be able to uh, administer fluids, whatever we need to do. So this is very important in many things that, that we're going to do. You are going to have an occasional dog that's nervous, that's uh, scared, maybe hurting. Just keep that into consideration. You do not want to put pressure on something that hurts. Uh, you don't want to be grabbing something that's wounded. Um, so just think about that in the, the, the overall process. The other thing is with this is by putting your elbow on their neck, you control the teeth fairly well. Not completely, but fairly well. They can still reach down and get your hand. So if you have one that's fractious, you may need to use the uh, muzzle restraint that we talked about or have someone else just actually hold the mouth so that you can control the, the teeth so you don't have that aspect. The muzzle is always a safer bet for the simple reason if the person is not well versed on handling the mouth, they themselves or you could get bit in the process. When we start talking about fractures and bandaging it, this is a prime uh, place that we'll need to put the dog in a lateral recumbency like this and use good restraints. Realizing if you have a fracture, it's going to be painful and you don't need to have a dog moving around, which potentially could hurt you or more importantly, could, we could hurt the dog in the process. So using our restraint of over the neck, grabbing the underneath side of the leg is very, very important here. That way we have the least amount of movement that the person holding is very, very vital for this because they're going to keep this animal from moving. Uh, if I'm dealing with a fracture, I want to be very, very cautious that I'm not moving it all around and causing tissue damage at the same time. So we want to have very, very good restraint here. One of the common things that you will probably come across in the field is um, broken legs. Um, with their hit by cars or you know sometimes even they've jumped out of windows or whatever in the case of a fire. So splinting the leg is something that can be done as a first aid type uh, situation until we can uh, get them to veterinary care. Uh, realize in general rule of thumb, you know, ideally you want to mobilize a joint above and below the fracture. Uh, sometimes that's very hard to do the way dogs are built, um, so that we need to be uh, cognizant of that. Um, uh, we do provide splints in the uh, kits to help. Uh, the other thing that you can do is you can also use just a heavy cotton padding um, 
to just provide a little bit of support um, and any um, type of, of splinting type material to minimize movement is important. The splints we use are Epi splints. Realizing on the back they're actually scored so that they can be broken to size um, because it's not a one size fits all. Uh, we're going to have different size limbs on that. So realizing it can be uh, uh, modified uh, accordingly. It doesn't take just more than even your heavy uh, bandage scissors. A lot of times you can cut this and break this to, to take care of it. Very important if you do cut it though, make sure you round edges and you provide some type of protection so that they do not get uh, cut up because Dogs, unlike humans, will continue to move. If they've got any support whatsoever, they're going to move. So you're going to have a little bit more um, issue with that. Understanding this is not going to be put on for long term. It is a short term thing, but we all like to keep that in consideration because some of these dogs are going to struggle and go through some things. Probably one of the most important things on putting on a splint in a dog is realizing everything on a dog is built in a funnel. So it is going to tend to migrate. So we have to take that into consideration. So the first thing I'm putting on a splint is we actually take white tape and we create what we call stirrups, which is just a matter of going down the leg so that we can um, later on provide a uh, some type of holding mechanism for that splint. So we're going to do this. If you want to take a tongue depressor, and, and put in between those two to, to hold them separate, you can. If you don't have that, you just put it on uh, accordingly. You want to go far enough up the leg that you have good um, tension or ad adhesion so that it's not going to slip. Second most important is a dog's not built like a human, it's not muscled like a human, so therefore we have to protect certain areas. Uh, on the back side of this leg is, is a, um, a pad that needs to be padded. Uh, you can put cotton balls and things like that on it, but typically what I use is just cast padding and do several layers. So we're going to put layers of cast padding on this dog, spend a little extra time, build it up a little bit more, in the areas of the, um, the pad there so that we do not have problems. Make sure you go all the way through the, the whole area that it, that's going to be bandaged. And I like to go up and over the, the elbow or the joint if we can so that we cut down on the um, irritation there. Now, I put a very light wrap on just for demonstration purposes here, but you can put a fairly heavy wrap on that. That The more wrap you put, kind of the more protection you have. This is the splints actually designed with a cup for the foot, so we're going to put that on, on this. Now, two ways that we can do this, at, at this point we can actually put gauze as a holding layer, which is much better, or if nothing else, we can go with the, the Coban or the uh, a vet wrap where we're going to put a layer of this on. Here's where the stirrups come in, where we'll separate this tape out, actually take a twist and stick it back on itself. That way it holds the, the uh, splint in position and then we're going to go ahead and tape over the top of it. I tend to leave the toes out where we can see them, so if you did get the wrap too tight or we cut off circulation at the elbow, we can see the toes are swelling and we know that we're in troubles there. Uh, don't leave too much out or it'll, it'll sometimes slip, but leave enough that you can, you can see. And then you can go ahead and wrap it up the, the rest of the way. Uh, this provides real good support for the leg. Uh, a lot of times they will actually run on a splint like this in, sp in spite of a very uh, badly broken leg. So just be aware that uh, they're not as, uh, uh, they have a much higher pain tolerance than humans do uh, on that. So they, they will respond a little bit differently. Uh, you and I would be laying there wanting uh, painkillers they're actually going to get up and do what they need to do. So don't assume because they got a broken leg that they're not going to run away because they will. Um, I've seen them in a dead run with a, a broken leg and not even miss a step. So just be aware of the process. One of the things that you'll probably be faced with a lot of times, especially in a fire situation, is a very dehydrated pet. Um, this is something that you can easily help in the field in the fact that dogs, we can give fluids subcutaneous. Um, I always call it the camel effect. We can give a whole bunch of fluids very quickly and they're going to use it as they need it. Realizing it, it's, there's a huge margin of safety 
where if you give too much fluids, it's just going to take a little longer for them to absorb, but it's not going to create any problem. Unlike giving too much IV where we start getting into respiratory problems or uh, too much volume, we can give it subcutaneous and they're just going to use it as needed. Uh, typically, we'll just use an IV bag, you know, prefer lactated ringers or isotonic uh, saline. Uh, please do not use anything that has uh, dextrose in it because it will cause a tissue reaction and potential sloughing of skin. So, as to the size needle, typically we're going to use about an 18 gauge needle. Um, you can use a 20 or even smaller, but it's just going to take that much longer. 18 is actually a, a good level there. Where this is going to occur, we're actually going to the, the shoulders here, in between the shoulder blades. Uh, how I typically teach that is we're going to tent it and just think of a TP and you are going to go in at about a 45 degree angle and go to the center of that TP. Uh, once you pop through the skin, usually you can feel it, uh, but the other double check is if you start your fluids and they're not running, you may be in the subcutaneous tissue or you could have went too deep and got into the muscle. The fluid should flow fairly readily once you're in the right position. So how that would look is we'd actually take, put our needle in. We're going to hold the fluids up and you can actually squeeze the bag, forcing the fluids to go very fast on that. If you're not sure how much to give, give a big tent, wait a little while, give them a little bit more if they absorb it very quickly. A large dog like this can easily take 500 to 1,000 mLs and, and be very safe. When you're dealing with small dogs or cats, probably about two to 300 mLs is going to be the, the maximum amount. Realize that we have a little different problem with the small dogs in the fact that if you give them too much, you're going to make them lopsided until they absorb that. Uh, realize that as the fluids uh, go through the body, if you've overdone it, it is going to migrate ventrally and so it's not uncommon for the legs to swell just a little associated with it. Short-term problem, not something to get overly concerned about. Our biggest concern is getting the fluids to the animal as quick as possible so that we can take care of their dehydration there. Um, realizing uh, with cats, you can take a cat that's fairly well down and out, give them fluids, and very quickly they become uh, Tasmanian devils. So just be prepared with a cat more so than a dog. You're going to get a much more abrupt change in their demeanor on that. Uh, dogs as a whole will, will pro progress a little slower in that process, but you will see changes fairly rapidly on them also. Another thing we see very commonly in Arizona are heat strokes in our pets and or in your fire. You may have a similar type situation where we have to get their body temperature down. Uh, normal body temperature on a dog is 101.5 to 102.5, so it will be higher. Um, this is taken rectally. Um, if you do not have a rectal thermometer or have access, you can take a axillary temperature but you need to add about a degree on that. So not quite as ac accurate as a rectal temperature, but something to be concerned about. Realizing a dog's cooling system is very different than humans. Humans, we actually sweat, and it works kind of like a swamp cooler to cool us. In dogs, they really do not have sweat glands other than in their paws and around their muzzle. How they cool themselves is actually by panting, and they have a circle of blood vessels right at the base of the brain that is just above the soft palate. So as they breathe hard back and forth, they're moving air across that area, cooling the blood vessels to the brain. It is not uncommon for dogs in Arizona that have overdone it or whatever to spike a temperature 105, I've even seen it up to 108, 110 degrees. At that temperature, they tend to stroke and we get into trouble. So the best thing you can do is quickly get those temperatures down uh, several methods that we can use is cool water in the mouth, uh, which will help cool those blood vessels. The other thing we can do is actually cool the blood vessels of the neck going to the brain. So you can take wet washcloths or just wet them, put them around their neck. You can put ice packs around the, the neck that will help cool. The other thing that will help also is you can put them in the axillary region or the groin region. Those are where some of the major blood vessels come out. So we are actually cooling some of that blood going back to the heart uh, on that. 
Um, and you can see he kind of likes that. It's warm in this room, so uh, uh, usually not a, a bad um, reaction to that. Realizing if their temperature is high enough, they are going to probably be comatose. Um, it's very important to check pupillary reflexes at that point because a lot of times they will go pinpoint and you have troubles. One thing to consider in the process is once they reach a temperature like that and you start cooling them down, a lot of times they lose the ability to regulate their temperature. So when you get that temperature, if it started off real high, when it hits about 104, uh, 104, 5, take the ice packs off and let them kind of slide into the normal temperature. If you take the ice packs and leave them on until they're 101 or 102, typically they're going to drop out the bottom. Um, so it's not uncommon you go from 108 and it'll drop down to 95 to 96 and, and a lot of times we're going to get in troubles at that point. So just be aware that you don't want to take them totally back to normal in, in the process. Uh, but it is very important to do that. Realizing we have ice packs here, if you don't have access to that, uh, you know, there's usually a good Samaritan in the crowd, have them go down to Circle K, baggies and ice cubes work very well. If you don't have that, even just pure water on the head and neck, uh, wet the dog down will help because then it works like a swamp cooler like the human part of it. Um, if you can put them in an area of a fan, uh, if you can get them in the shade, all of those things are, are helpful in the process. When we're dealing with a lot of the wounds that you'll be faced with, your, your basic knowledge is going to apply. You know, we need to clean up the wounds as best we can, um, and we need to prep it so that it can go on to a veterinarian to do the, the, the final uh, repairs on that. One thing, and I don't know how much you use it, but something we very commonly use in our field is KY jelly. So if you have a wound that's gaping open, uh, that's exposed to the air, I really, as a veterinarian, appreciate it if you slather it up with KY. Um, KY being water soluble, it helps protect more than anything else all the hair getting into the wound. So be very careful if you can, if you do rinse it, get the hair off of it. Put the KY on there and that provides a protective barrier so that we don't get a whole bunch of hair in there as a secondary problem. Um, something that can be washed up when we do our, our skin prep for surgery and it really helps in the overall process. One thing to remember, and a lot of our wounds too, um, if you're bandaging, remember dogs are made in funnels, so everything wants to slip. So wherever you can, I, I recommend some type of adhesive bandage um, so that you can hold the, the bandage in place. Um, a lot of times I will apply this to the skin, or, or to the hair first, and a total wrap around, and then I'll, use, uh, I'll stick the rest of my bandage material there so that I don't have a lot of adhesion to the skin, realizing there again, they've got a lot of hair, anything that, that's put on there that's sticky, a lot of times means that we're going to remove hair in the process of removing the bandage. So we try to minimize the actual adhesion to the, the hair, but we need that as a stabilizer in the, the bandaging process. A lot of the wounds that we're going to be faced with our animals are going to be very similar to humans. And so we're not going to go into a lot of detail on that, um, you know, because you've already been trained in that and you, you're going to use common sense. But we're going to have evisceration. We are going to have gunshot wounds. We're going to have impaling type wounds. You know, I would handle them exactly the same as you would in a human uh, and just, there again, transport as soon as possible. I think it's very important that you are aware of the emergency clinics in your area and those areas that are set up to do that. Um, and, and I realize a lot of times you are focused on the human casualties at, at that point and so um, it's always good to ask for a good Samaritan. There's a lot of people out there that would love to volunteer to help in that situation. So don't underestimate the, the potential of that help also. One thing with the program, we understand that each individual fire department and district has their own set of rules. So it's important that you check with your individual fire station and fire chief as to what is allowed for your department. We'd like to give you the tools to be able to do a lot of things, um, realizing we are talking life-saving uh, situations here. 
One of the things that you may be faced with is uh, allergic reactions, which is a very common place in the field. Uh, realizing, as you well know, there, there's two basic uh, levels of reaction. You're going to have more of a mild reaction, and you're also going to have anaphylaxis there. The more mild reactions typically we treat with a cortisone or some type of anti-inflammatory, um, the doses which will follow. Uh, and this is just a design, designed to settle the reaction down. In most cases, this is going to be all that's necessary. In the case of anaphylaxis, then we may be required to use something like the EpiPen or some epinephrine. Um, this is typically given IV. Another area that we might be faced with is the need to give IV fluids. Uh, if we have an animal that's in severe shock and the subcutaneous uh, fluids is just not going to be enough or we have some type of bleeding wound that we need to start fluids, IVs can be started. We typically use the cephalic vein on the uh, front of the leg. With IV fluids, if we do have shock, uh, IV cortisone is also uh, a very big help in a lot of the cases, um, so that can also be administered at the same time. IV catheters can be set, um, uh, very similar to what you're going to do in the human, the only difference is we've got hair. Uh, typically, especially in a, a life-saving situation, we do not bother shaving, we don't do that. We actually find that we get a higher infection rate a lot of times by irritating the skin. So this is one of those things, we find the vein, set the catheter, and move on.